Well, last week we began what will be a, ultimately a three-part little mini-series looking at these four verses as we consider and discuss the topic of contentment. As we discussed last week, uh, we looked at discontent because discontentment seems to be the prevailing mindset, the cultural mood that we're in. Discontentment abounds. It's everywhere. We're dissatisfied with our jobs, our marriages, our vocations, our politics, with everything it seems. And so we looked at discontentment and we put it sort of on the examination table and we saw that discontentment really is not the fault of our circumstances, but rather discontentment comes from an inside problem, a personal problem. And then we looked and saw that discontentment, in fact, represents a theological problem. In fact, it's an idolatrous problem. So we looked at the problem, so to speak, and I promised that today we would start looking at the secret of contentment. And I'm not going to stand up here and speak as some sort of guru who sat on the mountaintop and have you know, reached the pinnacle of enlightenment. I'm a student in process too. But I believe as students we can compare notes and help each other spur each other on the journey. Now, learning the secret, learning the secret of contentment implies the acquisition of knowledge first and then practice second. And thanks to Aristotle, we know that there are five types of knowledge. That's something you learned today. There are five types of knowledge, but the two that concern us today and the two that we're most familiar with in our culture, is science and art. Science refers to the acquisition of facts as principles themselves. And art refers to the practical knowledge of how to interact with the world or things in the world to produce the thing you're wanting. For example, I just got a big green egg a few weeks ago. Good investment. And the, the science of how to use this thing is really simple. You know, it's like a grill. You light a fire in it and you close it. And Okay, but the art of making that fire the right size so that way you keep it at the low temperature you want for smoking and, and actually producing the amount of smoke you're wanting, well, that takes a little finesse. Okay? Science and art. This week, we're going to look at the science of contentment, and next week, which will be three weeks from today, we will look at the art of contentment. So today, we're going to look at what are the scientific principles of contentment that we need to grasp, that we need to have as a, as a base of understanding before we're even going to be able to finesse it and, and work it out in practice to become more content. The good news, though, is that contentment is out there. If you are in a situation right now and you're having a really hard time being content, if you find yourself being very agitable, irritable, grumbly, complaining, dissatisfied, know in the midst of your darkness that contentment is out there, okay? So we're, we're going to start by looking at what are some of the paths that people have taken to try to address the issue of discontentment and how do those and why do those fall short? And then we'll look at principles for contentment itself. Um, as is self-evident, humans are, cr are chronically plagued by discontentment. I mean, we struggle with it. Just, just, just this week, we were driving up from the city, and I was stuck in traffic yet again. And I, and I just started grumbling. It was only Kay and me in the car, and I was grumbling. It's like, you know what? Everywhere I go, there's traffic. I was in college in Chicago, and I will say that it was worse in Chicago than here. 
Okay? But it was terrible. And I would have got out and walked, except I would have had to walk through the hood, and that ain't happening. So I, I'm, I drove. And then I go to D.C., and oh, man, that's terrible. And then I go to Alaska, and it wasn't that there was traffic so much as there was only one road. And because there was one road, whenever there was an accident or something, everything shuts down. And then I go to Germany, and there's traffic. And then I come here, and there's traffic. It's like, why can't I get some open road? And I was grumbling about my circumstance. When really, if I had paused and reflected on it, there's a lot I can learn about my own impatience and my own sense of entitlement to be catered to that I can learn from my circumstance. But contentment is out there, and we want to find it. We know there's contentment because we get regular fleeting glimpses of it. And I would suggest to you that these regular fleeting glimpses of contentment that we get are put there by design. We are designed in creation to find fleeting glimpses of contentment so that we will hunger for a greater lasting contentment. It has been observed that for every hankering or desire that exists in the created order, there is a corresponding thing that meets that desire. Ducks like to swim. And guess what? There's such a thing as a body of water. Bears like honey, and so there are honeycombs. Birds like to fly, and so there's this thing called air. We get a growling in our stomach, and there's such a thing as food. We desire soft places to sleep, so there's such a thing as a bed. We desire to stretch our muscles, so there's such a thing as open road where we can run. There is a thing that corresponds to every desire, every appetite. And we have a deep desire for contentment. And then we have all these things that temporarily, but not completely, satisfy that longing. And so this observation led C.S. Lewis to point out, it must be then that this longing we have, which can't really be permanently and fully satisfied by anything we experience, this longing then must be in us to point us to something greater. Something that can't be found in this realm. It can only be found in Lewis's logic in Christ and in His kingdom, in His country. And that seems to make sense that this itch you have within you for contentment can be met in the here and now in, in little scratch itch ways, but the deep abiding contentment will come with Christ and His kingdom. So every time you have within you the longing for contentment, and every time you experience something that scratches that itch, recognize that it is a sign pointing you to something greater that will ultimately satisfy your desire for longing. Your desire for contentment is a pointer to the one who can ultimately satisfy. This is what Augustine meant when he said that our hearts are restless until they rest in God. This isn't new. Isn't it awesome when you study and you learn that God's people have been saying the same thing for hundreds and thousands of years? It is. Contentment is out there. We have fleeting glimpses of it. And these glimpses for the wise person will point them to the creator and sustainer who can give them all joy. But for many in the world, there are four basic ways that we respond and we try to deal with the chronic discontent that's in our lives. First, and probably most common in our culture and context, we have those who simply try harder. These are the ones who refuse to believe that the problem is inside. The problem is always something out there. That boss, that spouse, the weather, the climate in this place, the, the big business, uh, whatever. The problem is always outside. And, and if I just keep trying, 
I'll find it. That's living in denial. It's living in a dream that refuses to accept that wherever I go, there I am. We are the problem. So trying harder simply won't cut it. Recognizing this, then a great many people just sort of collapse into a defeated acceptance. They surmise then that contentment must really be impossible. And so they just develop coping mechanisms to get by. Whether they're more destructive in the form of of, of various addictions, or maybe it's something that seems innocent, like just chronic TV watching. Just sitting there for hours, zoning out. Or maybe it's binge eating. Or maybe it's just exercising as an escape. But people who feel defeated and can't change their circumstances, that it's hopeless, find an outlet typically in the form of escape. And that's defeatist. That is not living in light of a joyous reality. The third thing that a lot of people do, and it may seem strange to you, but it's actually really common in most parts of the world, or or in the most populated parts of the world, and it's basically, they say, hey, you know what? We have all these desires, and every time I have these desires, they get squashed, and that's what leads to my heartache. That's what leads to my disappointment. And so, in light of that apparent reality, Buddhism has come along. And it may seem foreign to you in in Georgia, but the teachings of Buddhism hold captive billions on this earth, and Eastern thought is all over. You hear you hear chi, you hear karma, you hear these terms in our in our culture. But the second noble truth of Buddhism is that the fundamental problem we have in our existence is we desire things. And so if you would simply stop desiring things, if you have no expectations, well, you won't be disappointed. And so Buddhist monks will spend their whole lives trying to detach themselves from everything around them, trying to stop any form of desire, because then they won't be hurt. Then they won't experience disappointment and heartache and pain. And so for them, nirvana is not entering heaven where it's blissful joy. It's the absolute peace of nothingness where they just blip out. And of course, that's not Christian. We all know that. But there's a great many people who erect walls thinking that the problem is their desire. And so if you've ever heard the Simon and Garfunkel song, uh, I Am a Rock, it's about someone who's tired of being hurt. And so they put themselves, because a rock never cries, and an island never, or a rock doesn't feel pain, and an island never cries. But we were meant to interact emotionally. We were meant for desire. And then the last way, and it's common in the Western world, it's basically a form of stoicism where we say, I'm going to be so driven by principle and duty that I'm not going to let my emotions get the best of me either way. And I'm just going to have a stiff upper lip and go steady the course. And when catastrophe strikes, I don't respond. And I'm just going to be like an emotional wall doing my duty. Does that sound like something Christians do sometimes? In the midst of incredible heartache, we just have a stiff upper lip. Did you know that Stoicism is grossly unbiblical? Even in this book, in chapter 3, we see Paul talking about sorrow and joy and longing. So either we just rush headlong and say, hey, I'm going to try harder, or I'm just going to resign myself to just accepting the fact that I can't be happy, to the problem is my happiness desire, and I'm just going to kill the desire, or, or I just have to just have a stiff upper lip and just operate on principle and duty and not worry about my feelings. All these are flawed, but they all share something in common. They think that the answer to your problem is within yourself. Some knowledge you attain, some mindset you adopt, 
some practice you implement, and then you will become content. And that's just not true. The prevailing notion that we are the masters of our existences is so common and so mistaken. It's, I just said that Eastern thought is all over the media and all in our culture, and it is. Think to Kung Fu Panda. Okay? The, the kangaroo Po, he wants to become the dragon warrior. And he wants to a, a receive the dragon scroll, which upon reading it will give him limitless power. And he finally obtains the dragon scroll. And what does he discover when he unrolls it? It's blank. And instead, it's kind of got a shiny surface so he can see himself. And so the whole point is that the, 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 the limitless power and the power to, and the, and the, to, to get limitless power it just comes from yourself from diving into and exploring and building up these reservoirs of just how awesome you are and being true to yourself. And that's, that's all over. But here's the problem. Discontentment, as we learned last week, comes from within us. Source of the problem, if the spring within our heart is welling up bitter waters, how are they suddenly going to start being sweet? If the heart is producing bad fruit, how is it suddenly going to, on its own, start producing good fruit? You see, the problem is within us. And like I said at the very beginning, the good news is, is that contentment is out there. And I chose that word intentionally. I did not say contentment is in here. I said contentment is out there. If you are to ever be content, you have to recognize up front that the ability to be content comes from without. You must appropriate to yourself something that is not natively yours. That simultaneously convicting and liberating. Convicting because it recognizes that I can't do it. Liberating in the sense that I can stop living in perpetual frustration that I can't conjure up the mojo. Contentment comes from without. So there are two, two principles then. The first is recognizing that contentment and joy are related. Contentment and joy are related. They are both states of being rather than emotions. Just like it is possible to cry at the death of someone and still be a joyful person, so too is it possible to be in a circumstance that is unpleasant, that is angering, that is sorrow-inducing, and still be content. Because contentment and joy are related. How do I know this? Well, if you look at uh, verse 12, he says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty. Okay, any and every circumstance, he knows how to be content. That exact same sentence in Greek, that clause, I should say, in Greek, is used in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And that is the arena in those verses for being joyful. So the same context in which we find joy is the same context in which we find contentment. If you think about it, the most content people you know are also the most joyful people you know. The most joyful people you know are also the most content people you know. Joy and contentment go hand in in hand. If you pursue your joy, then you are pursuing your contentment. And if you want contentment, pursue joy. They both are based upon an exquisite 
knowledge of God's working in the past, the present, and the future. It's because of what we know Jesus has done for us in the past that we are able to have confidence in what he will be doing in the future. And because we have confidence in what he will be doing in the future, then in the midst of the present, I'm able to find meaning, significance, and hope. Past, present, and future all come together based upon a knowledge and confidence in who God is and what He is doing for us. And that gives us joy. But that also invigorates my circumstance with meaning so I can find contentment. So, first principle to contentment is that it is related to your joy. Pursue your joy and you will pursue your contentment. The second principle is that um, the story of the gospel, the story of Christianity, I should say, is one in which God is working in us from start to finish. This book, Philippians, shows God working in the lives of believers from beginning to end. Paul is is open and honest in Philippians 3.9 when he celebrates the crediting of God's Right, of Christ's righteousness to him by faith when he says that he wants to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Okay, so he sees that he becomes a Christian, he's declared righteous, he's declared right with God by virtue of God working in him to give him Jesus' righteousness, but then he also sees that he's going to grow and that he's going to progress in the spiritual life on the basis of God working in him. We learn this in Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in, in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So, Paul starts with God working. Paul gets carried along by God working. And so it is no surprise then that he recognizes from start to finish the will to, to, to act psychologically, emotionally, volitionally. It comes from the enabling work of God. Thus he sees even that his ability to be content in these circumstances comes through that same agency. Look at verse 13 of chapter 4. I can do all things through my incredible powers of of, 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 of resiliency through my incredible ability to maintain calm under pressure through my long term perspective through my, through my a great karma is that what he says? no I heard someone quote it I can do all things through him who strengthens me From start to finish, the Christian life is a story of God's work in your life. If you are to be content, it is because He is working in you. It comes from without. It is His work in your life. So, we have to then appropriate and wrap our arms around it and celebrate it. He's cognitively aware and he's experientially sure that God is absolutely sovereign over the sum total of his Christian experience. And he is deeply, deeply committed so that in chapter 1, he can say that he is confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. We are going somewhere, brothers and sisters. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And he's sure of this. And he is captivated by that knowledge that everywhere he goes, that is the arena in which God is making him more and more like Jesus so that he will be fit for heaven. And since he has a deep abiding confidence in what God is doing in his life, he can then look at every single possible circumstance and every possible variable of every circumstance as the playground in which God is working out 
his salvation. It goes back to what Paul was talking about in chapter 2, where, or in chapter 1, when he says that to live is Christ. He wants no matter what, Jesus to be glorified. Pursuing Jesus, looking more fully in his radiant, glorious face, is Paul's all in all. And so because of that, he can look at any circumstance as an opportunity to do the mission that Jesus has for him there so that he can become more like Jesus. So, a couple principles. You have to pursue your joy and your contentment together. Two, it comes from without by seeing that it's the work of God in your life. You were saved for joy and for contentment. And God wants you to find your satisfaction in Jesus. Because everything else you lose when you die. Only Jesus, when you die, you get more and more of Him. So if He is your joy, if He is your contentment, then you're only going to get more. So we can say, hey, all right, those are good principles. But it says that Jesus strengthens. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Well, how does he strengthen me? Have you ever wondered that? How am I strengthened? Well, you're strengthened in a number of ways. I would suggest a few. One, you're strengthened by the fact that there's an ongoing work going on in your life called sanctification where the Holy Spirit makes you more and more like Jesus, so that hopefully, over the course of the long haul, you're seeing that you exemplify the traits of heaven more than they used to be. So for example, this week I was grumbling about the traffic, whereas 17, 18 years ago in Chicago, I used to get really, really, really irate. So I'm going somewhere, right? But there's this thing called sanctification going on in your life. And you have to trust that the Holy Spirit is working you in you. And that gives you, that itself gives you encouragement. I'm not as bad as I once was. By the grace of Jesus, he's making me more like him. And it comes and starts and stops. And But we're going somewhere. Isn't that great? That encourages me to face the here and now. Second, he encourages us by reminding us or by being for us a model of faithfulness in the worst of circumstances. Christ went through, it's not much of an exaggeration to say, and it's fairly accurate to say, He went through hell for us. Betrayed by His friends. Betrayed by the very people He came to serve and to save. Died being mocked. and Most of us, I mean, it's horrible. And then He endured the wrath of God. We will never experience that. I don't care how cursed you think your life is. You will never experience the wrath of God the way Jesus did. And he did that without a complaint. So he's a model for us of that. But he also strengthens us because he has been exalted. And he reigns over all creation. So he controls every circumstance and he ensures that every circumstance you are in is under his control so that it is subject to and subservient to your sanctification. Did you know that? That every circumstance you're in is designed to serve the process of your sanctification. That frustrating boss, those wild kids, that cold marriage, it is designed to make you more like Jesus. He controls life circumstances. But he also strengthens us by reminding us that he has placed us on a mission in every circumstance we are in. We learned that back in chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. You are put here to deal with that ailing parent. You are put here to deal with that ornery neighbor. You are put here to deal with those 
crazy grandkids. You are put here to tolerate your, your beard-wearing pastor. We are on a mission. And it's helpful to remember that Jesus as sovereign Lord of the universe is guiding everything and he's making it subservient to the grand goal of your sanctification because when you finally arrive in heaven perfect, oh, what a story you'll tell. And Jesus will get all the glory and you will get all the good. So, He strengthens you. And He does it for the purpose of your final and fixed contentment and joy in Him. So that way, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, with myriad upon myriad of your brothers and sisters, you will tell the tale of the Lamb who was slain for your salvation. And how he worked through every possible circumstance, overcame every conceivable obstacle, so that in the final analysis, you and I are woven together into a remarkable tapestry of grace. And we are erected into an enormously glorious temple of living stones. And so he the grand lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb who was slain, is all glorious. And we find all of our deepest longing satisfied forever in Him. So in the here and now, recognize that is the goal. And to get you here, Christ strengthens you. And He reminds you and He works in you. And He gives you the confidence that no matter what you're facing, it will get you there. But then, You have to operate out of that confidence. You have to appropriate that to yourself so that you're able to look at every circumstance as the arena of your sanctification and recognize that you are right where and when God wants you to be for that purpose. And only then will you be armed with the knowledge to say, I can be content in this traffic. I can be content with my pay not being as much as I would like. I can be content with my body not acting the way I want it to act, which is the way it acted 20 years ago. Only then will you be able to do that. But once you grasp that, oh, you are well on the way to making Jesus look glorious so that in the greatest moments, the moments that count the most for you and the people around you, you will be a witness that will make Jesus look marvelous. So please, come back in three weeks and we'll talk about some tips for cultivating contentment in our lives. Let's pray.